When emergency first responders were overwhelmed by Los Angeles County's most destructive fire yet, a band of surfers, along with their neighbors and friends, stepped up to defend their home turf in Malibu. Their devotion to home drove them to show up for their community during the fire and for years afterward. And now, a model they call the Community Brigade Program could change everything leading to more lives and more homes saved during the increasing wildfires across not just California, but the world. Join reporter Adriana Cargill from KCRW, NPR's All Things Considered, Crooked Media, and more, as she investigates a wildfire story that is not depressing, but is, in fact, a clear hope for the future. Listen now to Sandcastles, an award-winning podcast about home, how we create it, and why we fight so hard for it. This week, things feel pretty out of control. You should probably get used to it. And later, the news. The Canadian West is burning. Oregon banned forever chemicals. Chat GPT plugins and a mobile app are here for everyone. And our friends at the All We Can Save project are hiring and more. But first, my name is Quinn Emmett, and this is important, not important, science for people who give a shit. The newsletter features the most important science news, how to think about it, and what the hell you can do about it. Hit subscribe right now in your podcast player or on your feed here to get the newsletter and my conversations with the world's smartest people every single week. You can find the email version and links to everything at importantnotimportant.com or right in your show notes. It's Friday, May 19th, 2023. First up, Here's your weekly action steps. Wildfire smoke exposure is directly linked to myriad health impacts due to poor air quality. Know your daily risk by using the Purple Air Outdoor Air Monitor. I've got one. Number two, we need to heal ourselves to heal the planet. Find resources and community to help with your climate anxiety or any anxiety through the Climate Mental Health Network. Number three, Act locally. Use REFED, R-E-F-E-D, to find current food waste policies and programs you can learn from and implement in your town. Number four, work in local government. We talked about it a thousand times, but BioBot Analytics provides wastewater testing tools so we can better estimate the number of COVID-19 and other disease infections in your community. And now for today's big question, kind of a topic. Does it feel like things are moving quickly? Life comes at you fast. It's true in high school. It's true in nationwide insurance commercials. And it's especially true today. As we continue to fight the last war, as they say, which is the Industrial Revolution, but also the next one, which is the Information Revolution. Now, before we go any further, a note. If you thought the Industrial Revolution was over, uh, it's only because you and me and our parents have enjoyed this relative blip of post-World War II Western stability, which, I'm here to tell you, is coming to an end. But for billions more folks, the Industrial Revolution is just the beginning. And for those folks, it's also inextricably entangled with an information revolution even the most online of us can barely wrap our heads around. You don't have to read a hell of a lot of history to understand how much industry transformed our societies and economies. How we built cities like Manchester and London and Pittsburgh and later Osaka, adjacent to these invaluable deep water ports, employing millions, building skyscrapers, creating all these new trades, and both metaphorically and literally electrifying the stock market. Now imagine that same process, but in West Africa or South Asia today, and at the same time as satellite internet, GPT-4, WhatsApp, social media, and where these new coastal cities, again, growing by leaps and bounds as millions migrate to them, just like they did in the West, those cities are already threatened by sea rise, despite a legacy of energy poverty and having contributed almost nothing to historical emissions. That's a different game. These are not the same thing. And to be honest, we don't really know how this is all going to go. It's safe to say we understand very little now But it's vital we understand this. Progress is accelerating. A storm of irrevocable change is here. And we have left many of our most 
fundamental requirements as humans, as a species, as a society, exposed to the elements, per se. Now, we couldn't always measure human progress the way we do today. And that's in part because life didn't always come at us as a species quite so fast. As a single early human, sure, circumstances changed almost immediately on a day-to-day -day basis. Got a cold? You're fucked. Infected tooth? That's it. Sprained ankle? You are a leopard food. But real, measurable, society-altering change took thousands of years. And progress is often one step forward, six steps back. We were almost wiped out a bunch of times. Early humans were constantly at the mercy of disease and predators and weather and natural disasters and more, having basically no idea why any of that shit actually happened, much less how to predict it or survive it. It was probably very exhausting and very, very confusing. So we invented religion. The other part was we literally couldn't measure progress. We didn't really know about or do archaeology until some proto-Italian dude named Flavio Biondo, which is a top-tier name, respect, that guy got interested in these overgrown hills, which turned out to be ancient Rome, and he was like, what's going on under those grassy hills where the cows are, anyways? Hence, archaeology. If you feel like a lot has changed since the dawn of the information revolution, I'm here to empathize with you. I get it. Or at least since the iPhone just shit can Blackberry and, you know, the mental health of millions of people. Again, like, you wouldn't be wrong. But it's evident now those are really just our first baby steps. If you look at what smartphones, for example, have brought, all the pros and cons, because there's nuance to everything, tell me we're not the baby who celebrated moments ago for a life-altering achievement, inevitably crashed a few steps later with its undeveloped cranium first into a, you know, mid-century coffee table or whatever. We have improved our fortunes greatly since the Enlightenment, I guess. And so much else has changed since Steve Jobs' little magic show. But I'm here to tell you that we've simply planted the seeds of an era that is already compounding on itself, showing us just how far we really have to go. Some of this is optional, right? We still haven't quite figured out what the Big Bang or Dark Matter are. We don't know a ton about the brain. We know that dinosaurs were a thing now. They were a thing for 250 million years and then kind of evaporated overnight while some of the rest evolved into birds. We can extract information-rich ice cores to understand past climate changes, which were not our fault for once. We can carbon date basically anything, including you, including your great-grandfather times 100 who got eaten by that leopard. On the other hand, while there are many, many unknowns unknowns, which we talked about before, about the future, we can predict the weather now, even if Apple's weather app keeps crashing. Um, we can survive much more of it, which is great, even if we're kind of making it worse. We've eradicated many diseases and kind of give up on other ones. We understand a lot more about our bodies and biotech and biology, except the vagina, because we ignored it. And we, turns out, have become our own most dangerous predator, which is a real pros and cons situation. And yes, mosquitoes are typically seen as our most dangerous predator because of the diseases they carry, but are not affected by themselves. Had podcasts about those, check them out. The real champ, of course, is bacteria, our oldest nemesis, and 100% the one that will outlast us. Anyways, other things. We can drive, pros and cons. We can fly, pros and cons. Uh, we can track our location, pros and cons. Uh, edit our genes, same thing. We can trade meme stocks on our Dick Tracy watches. We can connect live with anyone, anywhere, at any time. Again, pros and cons. We know recycling doesn't work, <sighs> pros and cons. As of last week, we can do brain surgeries on fetuses in the womb. That's amazing. Unfortunately, we can also shoot like city dissolving missiles at each other across distances and to places our ancestors didn't even know existed. That's cons all the way down. Again, we've come a long way. Not only can supercomputers and trusted meteorologists predict storms with increasing accuracy and longer lead times, but the internet and social media have enabled more of us to bear live witness to weather and geological carnage 8,000 miles away. Storms that in the not too distant past, we'd never 
have even heard about. So the effects from this progress are twofold, now that we can measure that, right? We have this awareness of other humans that can hopefully build empathy for others um, that have far less than we do. But of course, on the other hand, we've built this news machine that profits off our dumb reptile brains and bad news, some days not doing nearly enough to focus on the big shit, and others making it inescapable, again contributing to a mental health crisis for a young generation that has really done nothing but ask us to fight for them. So, yeah, we've come a long way, and even more so recently, again, accelerating. All this blows minds on the daily, but it's kid stuff compared to what's coming. And we're already not dealing with it well. As the receipts of this miraculous industrial revolution it was, and all the consolidated power structures that fueled it and came from it, all those receipts are coming due. This is how it's going so far. Because as activated and resolute as these young people may be, and as behind the eight ball we are on, say, fertility rates, again, something else we didn't really understand before, and as clearly revolutionary as surgery in the womb may be, forcing women to give birth no matter the circumstances, often delivering straight into poverty, does not an equitable, future-proofed society make, and neither does rolling back voting rights. And that's no matter how many emails your goddamn large language model can summarize, right? So the point is, for most of human evolution, revolutionary change happened gradually over time, and then suddenly. We've talked about other revolutions before. Basically, involved parties would herald and make bank on progress with little interest or perspective on their actual costs, while everyone else eventually felt the whiplash of a world that was changed. For the rest of our lives, we're only in the suddenly part, so we really need to get used to it, even if we can. Let's use solar power as an example. Solar is drastically cheaper and growing faster than we've ever imagined, honestly tracking right along with social media and the iPhone. But it's not growing anywhere near fast enough, though, despite cratering prices for polysilicon and a shitload of barren rooftops, and highways, and canals and parking lots that could, once utilized, really take some of the wind out of, joke, um, some of these land use issues that are real. As my friend Michael Thomas tweeted this week, the charts in our actual newsletter, as far as solar is going, as fast as it's growing, we need it to grow by seven times as much over the next 10 years to be on the track for net zero. Not 70% more, seven times as much. So we actually have to go faster. The whiplash of something like AI, or in this case, an entirely new power sector, can feel like a lot. But in the words of a man, once chased by a T-Rex, must go faster. There are myriad obstacles in the way of unlocking much faster solar progress. Again, as an example, two things, or I guess like nine things, can be true at once. We are way ahead of projections, which is great, but it turns out we're far behind our needs. And that's because of, and again, our goal here is to break down these problems. Not a, it's not exclusive to these, but it's a lot of it. Citizens United and our super corrupt Supreme Court. Um, what about ism? Subsidies. NIMBYs and all the shitheads who fund them. Michael Thomas has talked about that. Um, doomism. Subsidies. Uh, greenwashing everywhere. Plastics, but especially when they don't want us to know it's plastic, like your clothes. Um, literally trillions in subsidies anti-woke, self-defeating politics in Texas. And all of that combined, but especially our transmission shit show. We gotta connect it all. There are a lot of question marks in that list. Those are known knowns. We know what we need to do and how to do it. We should actually feel really lucky about that stuff. Taking advantage of our few remaining known knowns and known unknowns will be pivotal to a less chaotic transition where everyone and every system is involved. Plus, Truly, it will be awesome to do these things. So as we finally begrudgingly calculate the net costs of the Industrial Revolution in the global North and West, so I guess the first part of it, right? Other countries, again, are just spinning up for the first time. And they're rerunning many of the same playbooks we did. But when we know so much more about the revolution impacts on air and water and ecosystems and health, Hence the necessary but real hypocrisy of telling 
a couple billion folks in China, in India, and elsewhere that they cannot use coal. And sorry for the devastating heat waves. Also, you can't have air conditioners. They feel make you feel better, and they make the whole thing worse. Despite some well-intentioned letters to the contrary, progress cannot be halted or slowed. Not on clean energy, or AI, or EVs, or biotech, because of international competition, or because that's just what we do. There's 8 billion people. Someone's going to keep working on it. We build tools for profits and pleasure, and often both. And then we see what happens. Costs be ignored, or lied about, or damned, or, you know, mostly kicked down the road. To successfully run alongside the future train that has arrived far ahead of schedule, we need to capitalize on the known knowns and, and do what we know how to do. We've done that. Blew a hole in the ozone? Not great. Did we fix it? You're goddamn right we did. Congratulations. We should learn from that. Smoking killed a ton of people. We used to tell pregnant ladies they could smoke. Anyways, we finally threw the kitchen sink at the perpetrators, and we were way better on lung cancer and all of it. Now, people are keeping their cars, their gas cars, for a record 12 plus years. That's not really helpful for turning over the entire fleet of the planet's automobiles, right? So on that front, we need to incentivize the demand side even further on top of what we've got to provide carrots and sticks to not just get new ones, but sell or trade your gas guzzlers in for smaller EVs. Or better yet, build and use public transportation, uh, biking, or walk while we build up the infrastructure and just demolish the supply side of fossil fuels once and for all. So we have to come to terms with an ever accelerating pace of change and that we have very little control over the margins of that. What we do have control over is the fundamentals of what's required to survive. Those haven't changed, if not to flourish, as a person, as a society, by building and future-proofing infrastructure and markets and institutions that will, at the very least, satisfy our most basic needs much more equitably and, with hope, be significantly more nimble in a future that arrived yesterday already. So, to be clear, we're going to have to make some unexpected choices about issues and questions and technologies and boundaries that didn't even exist months or even weeks before. But we can actually practice making them. And this is key. One of my favorite books is called The Power of Ethics. It's by an author, Lisa Sweetingham. And as Lisa wrote, being clear about your own principles, ideally before you face life-defining choices or need to express your opinion, can help ground you when you're faced with an unexpected difficult decision. It can help keep the decision at hand, connected to, and consistent with many other ethically thoughtful decisions you have made. It makes sense. None of us can stop this train now. We can participate in it. All we can do is to try and run alongside it, building a fundamentally better world for ourselves, and most importantly, for the generations to come after us. And now the news! Our friends at the All We Can Save Project are hiring a programs and community manager. And there's details right in the newsletter or at the All We Can Save website. Number two, could enormous robots dramatically speed up solar farm construction? Sure, fuck it, let's do it. Number three, how can we restore valuable oyster reefs without oyster shells? Great question. Number four, octopus energy, best name ever, continues to be a model for everything else. And last, the Canadian West continues to burn this week, and climate change, we can tell, we can measure it, is a big reason why. In COVID news, I know, this isn't COVID-specific. I wrote about that big update and, and made the thing last week, but this could be monumental, and I've talked about it endlessly. We have, but we have to do the work. The CDC finally released a new health-based indoor ventilation target, and the American Society of Heating, Refrigerating, and Air Conditioning Engineers released its own enhanced ventilation standard. Anyways, uh, Joseph G. Allen, a great leader on this stuff, wrote a whole piece on why that could really be a game changer. It could make such a difference to level the playing field, you guys. Um, in food and water news, uh, first, Oregon banned forever chemicals in takeout food containers. Number two, a uh, story about how plant-based food makers can fight back against meat and dairy disinformation. Number three, if growing one almond requires 3.2 gallons of water out west, how do we even reconcile that? Number four, 
Great story in the New York Times about the women working for food sovereignty on island territories in the climate era. Number four, there's undercover audio of a Tyson employee revealing that free range chicken is bullshit. And there's even more information on humane washing in the newsletter. And in health and bio news, uh, first, these are the cities. We've got a list of the cities with the most bike deaths per capita. And again, I share that news to illustrate where we can make drastic improvements, save lives, improve outcomes. Um, not to be outdone by its northern neighbor, the South Carolina House passed a six weeks abortion ban. Fuck those people. Uh, next, United Healthcare wants doctors to get prior authorization for colonoscopies, and doctors and patients are super pissed off because that's just dangerous and needless. Last, where American air pollution is improving and getting worse, again, we've got a map. You should know what's going on. Last, in computer news, OpenAI rolled out ChatGPT plugins to everyone and a mobile app. I'm sure it's fine. Number two, ransomware hackers are zeroing in again on under-resourced cities and towns and their infrastructure. And last, the Supreme Court ruled Twitter and Google are not legally liable for terrorists using their platforms. That's it for this week. You can hit subscribe wherever to get your uh, next week's issue straight to your feed or right here. To go deeper, of course, visit importantnotimportant.com. Tell your friends, buy a t-shirt. Thanks for being a part of our community, and thanks for giving a shit. Have a great week.